Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for having me here this year. I uh, was in LA last year. Uh, you'll hear from the funny sounding voice that uh, I'm from New Zealand, not Australia, contrary to popular belief. Um, best way to push my buttons is to tell me I am from Australia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, I've got to try and cram a lot of information into 20 minutes, and Kiwis are notorious for being fast speakers anyway. Um, just read the slides, so it'll be like subtitles through there. So. Um, otherwise, it's just going to seem like an uh, episode of Flight of the Concords for you guys. <laughs> Alright, um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, endurance sport and applying some of the ancestral health or paleo type principles to training endurance athletes. Uh, part of the reason why I've got an interest in endurance athletes is, I guess, a similar uh, reason as to why I was talking about corporate health last year. Uh, within corporate health, we, we've all got jobs and that's where we spend the vast majority of our time. That's where a lot of people are. So if we want to try and reach out towards um, a, a lot of the population and, a, and get them to buy into some of this ancestral health stuff, we need to go where the people are. On the sporting side of it, we've got a large number of people going into endurance sport. So if we look at the likes of cycling, cycling's being pitched as the, the new golf. Um, and I will say, while I'm going to talk about endurance sport, I'll refer mostly because of my own spandex fetish and justifying that, I am a cyclist. So I'll talk about cycling a whole lot. Um, so we need to, to look at uh, cycling where you know, it's referred to as the new golf, we've got uh, triathlon which is drawing a large number of people in. All of these sports are, have got a very, very large number of masters athletes going into them, so they're the, the 30 plus, 40 plus athletes um, going in. These are also the same people who are very, very concerned about their own health. And a lot of the time they're going into those endurance sports as a means to do something about, the, about their health. So that will be their, their initial entry point, I guess. So, um, they'll decide that they're a little bit out of shape, they need to get healthier, they need to drop some body fat or whatever, um, and so they'll go and buy themselves a bike, and they might sort of start recreationally, um, and eventually someone will try and coax them into doing a, a local race, and then they'll get bitten by the bug, and then they're in, um, trying to go into the elite, uh, elite level. Um, now I've got down the bottom a, a time code there. Now if, we, if we're going to talk about endurance sport from a physiological standpoint, we're talking about anything that lasts longer than about 40 to 60 seconds terms of the energy systems being used. That opens up a huge range of, of sports that we can apply some of this endurance template work to. Um, so that's anything from our classic endurance sports, so things like our cycling, our running, swimming, rowing, those sorts of events, right down to maybe even some of the CrossFit Games types of events. Um, they'll certainly exceed that, exceed that time code there. So we're talking about a, a huge number of uh, sports that people are engaging in. Um, now, we've, we've got this situation at the moment where we've got a, a case of, sort of paleo primal versus the mammals. Now, for those who uh, are unfamiliar with it, mammals is middle-aged men in lycra, <laughs> uh, of which I probably am one of those. Um, and perhaps we've got competing demographics uh, going on. So, so again, we've got these people who are, are engaging in these sorts of sports primarily for their health. Obviously, the, the whole paleo primal thing is, is about sort of improving people's health um, first and foremost. But there's these, some of these uh, perceptions and misconceptions around what um, paleo primal lifestyles are versus what's actually required to be successful in some of these endurance sports. So uh, many of these people will believe that uh, a paleo diet is a very, very low carb diet and that's incompatible with um, endurance sport. That it's all about just doing high intensity intervals or getting big and buff in the gym and that's not what endurance cyclists are about or, or other endurance athletes are, are about. So, um, and it's not helped by the fact that we often see some of the, the popular magazines that go with these sports, the likes of the Runner's World, the, the Bicycling Magazine, that do reviews on the paleo diet um, and say that it's, it's not compatible with endurance sport because it's too low carbohydrate and so on and so forth. So perhaps when someone's just laid out $15,000 on a new bike and they go and look at the paleo diet and go, well that doesn't really support my cycling, Therefore, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stick with the conventional wisdom as far as the, the dietary side of things are concerned. So uh, can we do something about that? How are we marketing things? How, how are we broadcasting our message out to some of these sort of non, non paleo, non-primal types? Are we using this illogical inference? And this illogical inference basically says that cavemen, um, our ancestors were athletes in, in their own right. They had to be as, just as part of their daily survival. Um, if we were to go and stick those athlete cavemen on a bike, in a boat, in a swimming pool, they will excel at it. Is that necessarily the case? Is that an illogical inference? Can we just mimic what they do in terms of their lifestyle and, and we're all um, suddenly elite athletes? 
Um, I don't think that's the case because there is no ancestral or um, evolutionary precedent for the likes of cycling and, and rowing and those sorts of things. They're, they're very, very novel from, a, um, from an evolutionary uh, standpoint. So should we be guided by our ancestry, that's of that illogical inference, or should we, should we be guided by the sport science when it comes to training these athletes? Um, and hopefully I'll show you which way we'll go. Um, when we look at the goals of endurance training, um, and I've split it out into to two camps, because um, there does seem to be two different approaches at the moment. Uh, three main goals is to improve your economy. Now your economy is the oxygen cost of, of your movement. So the idea for an endurance athlete would be to move as rapidly as they can at the lowest possible oxygen cost, so they've, they've got a good economy. Uh, we talk about their fuel efficiency. So from a fuel efficiency standpoint, you want to be burning a higher amount of fat in your fuel mix. Uh, we know that our glycogen stores are relatively limited and we can chew through them at a very rapid pace when we're engaging in some of these sports. The more heavily we can rely on the, the fat side of things, the, the longer we can, um, we can go. And uh, there's a degree of robustness required. So when you are someone who's built to walk on two legs and stand upright, suddenly cramping yourself into a rowboat or on a bike puts a whole lot of strain on the body that it's not designed to take. So we need a degree of robustness to, in order to cope, cope with that. When we look at a couple of the approaches there, so the, the popular or conventional approach uh, for economy, so um, increasing our or decreasing our oxygen cost, most people will train at their anaerobic threshold or, or their lactate threshold. So these are the classic cyclists who step out the door and they just ride on the limit right from the get-go. So they're pushing themselves as hard as they can at their highest sustainable pace. Um, our paleoprimal approach, we seem to have emphasised the high intensity interval training side of things. So that is to go out and, and work within short bursts, and we all talk about the overlap that if, if we work in these short bursts and these high, high intensity intervals, we actually gain some of the benefits that we might have done if we'd engaged in chronic cardio. Uh, from the fuel efficiency side of things, conventional approach is very much based around a high carbohydrate diet, so trying to maximise our glycogen stores. If we can super compensate them, top them up as high as we can, then we can, we can last a little bit longer with our, our sport. The paleoprimal approach tends to be at the lower carbohydrate end of the scale. Um, and as far as dealing with robustness, most endurance athletes will tend to emphasise the stretching component, the flexibility component, over doing uh, any sort of strength work. Um, and within the paleoprimal fields, we probably tend to err on the side of the, the strengthening over the, the stretching side of things. Uh, so what's been our contemporary research focus for the last few years? Um, very interesting that there are lots of different approaches coming out. With regard to addressing the economy, there's a, 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 an approach called polarised training, and I'll go through each one of these individually. Uh, fuel efficiency, we're starting to look at this, this method called train low, race high. And robustness, we're starting to talk more and more about building strength before applying power um, within endurance sports. So we look at the polarised training first. So polarised training is, is very much based around training at either end of an intensity scale and cutting that middle ground out. So that, that classic chronic cardio sitting at your highest aerobic pace, we're trying to cut that out as, as, as much as we can. Um, so we're either training at a very, very high, so these are our classic high intensity interval uh, approach, or we're training at a very, very low um, intensity overall. It's interesting when you go through the research papers to see which side of that scale the bias lies on. Now, if you read within the paleoprimal circles, you would read probably predominantly about the high intensity interval training side of things. But when you look at it from a research standpoint and looking at elite athletes, we can see that the vast majority of the volume is concentrated towards the low intensity end of the scale. So right across the board, across different, uh, different modes, so skiers, cyclists, runners, rowers, very, very low, vol uh, low intensity volumes make up the, the bulk of their training overall. Uh, there's a saying within cycling circles that every ride is a race. So um, novice and recreational athletes tend to perceive elite athletes as people who train on the limit all of the time, for the most part. They might, they might know that they have the odd recovery day here and there, but perceive that when they go out and train, they train hard. And so when these novice and, and recreational athletes try and mimic those people, they try and do exactly the same. And often they will skip the recovery days or the easy days in order to focus on what they think is going to give them the, the biggest payback. And so every ride, run, swim becomes a, a race. And you classically see this with you know, two cyclists next to each other, two guys in a rowing machine in a, a gym. They'll just try and beat each other up all the way through. Um, and they're all, always kind of constantly pushing themselves up towards that anaerobic threshold. 
Um, again, when we go through the research and, and have a look at it, and uh, interesting that the, the Olympics is just about to finish, um, when we look at Olympics and Olympic endurance events, even though they compete at those very, very high intensities, the bulk of their training is done well below lactate um, threshold intensity. Um, and possibly uh, up to about 80% of that uh, training overall is done well below that lactate uh, threshold intensity. So it's all kind of sitting there within the, the research when you go and pull it out. Um, what about uh, applying this to non-elites? Does, does it still hold up? Uh, well, if we look at some of the papers, they're starting to question whether or not this current interval training phase um, is well suited to uh, non-elites. So the takeaway take from that is that if you're an endurance athlete, you should be looking at uh, probably no less than about three quarters of your training overall done at these low intensity um, intervals, uh, interval levels, uh, sorry, low intensity endurance levels, uh, with only about 10 to 15 percent at their top end. And that's not very much. So when you consider that um, as a, a non elite athlete, you might only have five or six hours up your sleeve, uh, up your sleeve for the week. 10% um, of that isn't going to be very much in terms of your overall uh, interval work, so you need to make it count. Now, in terms of that, uh, what, what's considered very low intensity, I've heard one cycling coach refer to it as guilt producingly easy. <laughs> and it's a, it's a very, very difficult thing to get your head around. I, I spent pretty much most of my summer trying to, to do this, this training. And it's very, very hard to sit up on the bike and just turn the pedals over without getting sucked into racing, without going, the legs feel fine today, I'm going to race, I've got the wind behind me, I'm going to race. You've got to try and switch off on that. It's, it's a lot harder to train at a low intensity, at that very, very low intensity, than it is to go out and do your interval work. Uh, the benefit is, if you do, do go and do that, your training tends to look something like that. So, <laughs> uh, Train low, race high. Uh, what we're looking at is manipulating our, our glycogen stores to try and improve our fuel efficiency. Now there's been quite a few different approaches uh, to doing this, so classically we've used the long slow distance training, so that's go out for three, four hours at a time um, at a relatively low pace. There's things called uh, twice daily training where you'll do a session in the morning, maybe have two or three hours um, off and within that two or three hours you, you barely eat anything and then you'll go out and do another session a little bit later on. You can do faster training and we've, we've looked at the high fat diets. When you look at the common ground across all of those, is they all induce a low glycogen state within the, within the person. Um, and that glo low glycogen state tends to increase the cellular signal. Uh, so as far as training adaptation goes, what we're trying to do is, is we're doing this training, uh, we're ramping up these signaling pathways, we get our gene ex expression, we get our protein synth synthesis, synthesis, and we get our training adaptation. Most people think training, training adaptation. They don't understand or they don't know the, the middle ground in between or they think about it in terms of uh, gross anatomical or physiological things. So it's things like my legs are getting stronger, my lungs are getting more um, efficient, my heart's getting more efficient, those sorts of things. They, they don't tend to think about it from a cellular level. Uh, one of the key areas that's been looked at is the uh, AMPK signal. So AMPK signals the energy status of each one of your uh, individual cells. Uh, when you're engaging in low, uh, engaging in endurance training with a, a low glycogen state, that's going to send a pretty strong signal that uh, the energy status is quite low, um, and that sort of ramps up that training adaptation. Uh, interestingly, carbohydrate consumed before, during, or during training decreases that AMPK activation. And so the, the common approach of carbo-loading before you go out and do your training, or making sure you've got your gels and drinks on the bike or your run or, or whatever, it looks like that, that approach, that sort of common wisdom that we have actually switch, switches off the AMPK signal and ends up blunting our adaptation. So what we're looking at now is encouraging people to go out in a, almost sort of an empty fuel tank state. So they're going out with their fuel light on. And that, again, that's quite difficult for athletes to do um, because you go out and your legs feel like concrete. And, so, and because every ride's a race, every run's a race, every time you go out you want to set a PB or a PR, it's a very, very difficult mindset to, to, to get it into because you do go out and you feel flat as a pancake some days. But maybe within that within your training, going out and being pretty flat and staying at that low end is exactly what you need in order to um, increase your adaptation. Um, so again, if we go through some of the, the research around, um, it looks like this, um, that ramping up our um, carbohydrate drinks and those sorts of things actually blunts uh, that training uh, stimulus and limits our adaptation. Um, there's a, a saying that I use with some of the, the people that I work with, that training is not racing. And so that some of the things that we do while we're training is not about mimicking the race. And you can equally apply that, I guess, to some of the things that we, 
um, do within the field of weightlifting, uh, non-endurance events as well. You know, if, if you want to hit a, a, a PR with a certain lift, you don't go in and just stack all the plates on every single session. You have to deconstruct some of those things, work on the different elements, and then bolt it back together again. And we do that within endurance works. And again, some of the things that we do within training won't necessarily lend themselves to, to racing at the time. Um, I'll finish up with the, the strength before power uh, side of things. Um, endurance athletes typically are afraid of the gym. They won't go, go near them. Um, cyclists in particular, because they're so afraid of putting on weight and muscle mass and, and think that will count against them. Um, and there's numerous benefits to that, but one of the things that they, they tend to be most afraid of is that they'll lose flexibility. Um, a lot of these guys struggle to kind of sit themselves on bikes, particularly the, the middle-aged guys. Um, they're coming in with tight backs and tight hips and those sorts of things, so um, they're worried if they do more strength training, get all muscle-bound, they won't be able to, to do their sport particularly well. Um, they're also worried that they'll lose their cardiovascular adaptation. And so any time that they spend off the bike, off the trails, out of the boat, is, not, is time that's not actually uh, making them go faster. Um, but again, does the research uh, support that? No, because we can go through and we can see that a well-constructed strength training program will improve your flexibility as much as static stretching, if not um, better. And so you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. If we look at um, the cardiovascular side of it, at an actual metabolic and molecular level, there's really not a lot of difference between the, the adaptations that you'd get from um, a, a strength training program suited to endurance athletes and actually uh, time on the bike. So they're not for the, for the minimum amount of time that they're going to spend in the gym, they're not going to lose a lot of uh, adaptation overall. So how do we bolt all of these things together? Um, so it looks like low intensity training and technical mastery dominates. Now when you're looking at improving your technique, honing your skills, you're better off doing it while you're under low load in that low intensity side of things. Um, again, within the, within the cycling field that uh, I'm involved in, we see lots of guys come in and they just want to ride fast, they buy the fast wheels, they get with the fast kit, um, but they don't know how to handle the bike. And you stick them in the middle of a large bunch and their reliability, both to themselves and to 50 other riders around them. Um, so use that low intensity work to, to hone your technical side of things. Uh, strength work needs to be undertaken and it's very beneficial. Um, and the high intensity training is very deliberate. So you go out with uh, maybe sort of one or two sessions in mind per week and you go out and you really nail it and it's, it's right at that top end. And we try and do this against a backdrop of um, training in a lowered glycogen state. That's not to say that you would race in that state. You would not go on the start line with your fuel tank empty. It would be fully topped up so that's that race high. But during training you can um, train down that low end of the glycogen scale. We've actually seen this before. and we've, we've been exposed to it for a few years now and I can see Mark standing up the back so he'll recognise the slide. We've been promoting this for a wee while within the Paleo Primal Circle. So this is from Mark's Daily Apple. So um, building our base around that slow movement side of things, adding in the, the lift heavy things, adding the strength work, and then topping it off with our high intensity work um, overall. So when we look at the sports science side of things and come back and answer this question, can we use evolutionary principles to guide the training of, of endurance athletes? Yes, we can, and we can do it from the standpoint that the sports science where it's currently heading is it, it's heading towards us. It's heading towards the field that we've known about for the last sort of two or three years and, and um, uh, we've been starting to apply amongst ourselves. But we're not, we're not doing it from a, a standpoint of um, just a, a nice little story that says cavemen were fit, therefore they're going to be fit on the bike. We're, we're well supported by the, the science. That's me done. Okay. So would you also recommend uh, going into a high intensity interval training with a glycogen depleted state? Uh, you can do. Um, generally it will depend on how big that session is going to be. If it's a very intensive short duration session, you could, you could get away with it. So what, what we're not saying is that you spend all of your time in a low glycogen state. We're not advocating low carbohydrate diets. You can be low glycogen but still be ha having a high carbohydrate diet. Um, overall. So that high intensity interval training session, yep you'll do it, you know, it's 20 to 40 minutes in length overall, that's not going to put a, a major drain on your tank. You wouldn't go out and do a, a 90 minutes interval training session and a low glycogen state would be too much stress overall, but you can do it. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. Another question? Yep. What, what's your view of 
doing the training in the local glycogen state, no carbs, but then on the race day, adding back some carbohydrate or carb loading the day before just for the race? It's, um, it's relatively e easy to do. The, one of the problems that's starting to come through is that when you're in a, on a relatively low carbohydrate diet um, overall, when, when I talk about that sort of in a, a paleo primal context, um, if you were to spend most of your time with that sort of diet and then suddenly turn up on the, the start line and start packing away the gels and the sports drinks, there is a degree of gastrointestinal distress that will go with that because the fructose loading within some of those gels and drinks is very, very high. Um, your body's suddenly not, not used to it. So there is, you may have to train yourself to handle some of those, and particularly they talk about ultra marathoners, um, ultra endurance athletes having to train their gut to handle that fructose loading again. Um, but there's not really too much of a problem with doing it through starches and glucose and, and, and those sorts of fuels. But, but what do you actually recommend then for the race day? Uh, for, for race day, ramp up your, your starches, so within sort of 24 to 48 hours out from, from race day, really lift your starches up, probably drop your fat intake down to, to maximise that, that reloading. Um, race day, you can come up with glucose solutions and, and glucose-based gels, those, those sorts of things. Through to bananas, dates, all, all those sorts of easy, easy fuels. But you would you'd go through periods where you'd, you'd trial those within your training. You wouldn't try something new on the, on the start line.